Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for providing the opportunity to talk at this nice seminar series. A uh, great pleasure. So all that I will be talking about today is uh, joint work with Piri Kusa. And the plan of my talk is to recall a little bit how the tropical correspondence theorem of Mikakin and Nishino Zibat and the complex case went, uh, which um, states that uh, the count of complex algebraic curves satisfying some constraints can be computed by counting tropical curves satisfying some constraints. And then I will be telling about the generalization of the complex correspondence theorem in higher dimensions, which was proved by Nishino Ziba to the real setup. And um, tell you some invariance results we obtained uh, by counting these real curves in higher dimensions tropically together with some signs. So uh, starting with the setup in the usual two-dimensional case in Mikakin, so to uh, state apologies the, for um, people, there are many people who are experts here that you may all know these were very, um, well, I just want to recall, you fix the degree data of a tropical curve, and uh, this is given by a finite collection of vectors in R2, which satisfy the condition that the sum of these vectors add up to zero. And if you fix such a bunch of vectors, it determines two things. First, such a data determines atomic variety. Uh, for instance, if you fix delta, the uh, vectors, these vectors, and if you consider the, then you can build up a toric fun in R2, uh, whose rays are generated by these vectors. And this determines, for instance, the toric variety P1 cross P1. And the second thing it determines is a bunch of contact orders with the toric boundary given by the divisibility of these vectors. So instead of fixing 1, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1, you could fix multiples of these, like you could multiply these by two, for instance, and then the divisibility would be two. If you fix data like this, this would um, mean that we would be interested in count looking at curves of degree one, one, but we could also have repetitions or multiplicities of these vectors, which would tell us about the contact orders we are considering. And the second data, apart from that we are fixing, is a general gen generic configuration of n points in R2. Then um, it is shown by Mikakin that there's a finite number of tropical curves of degree delta and genus given by this number of points plus one minus the cardinality of this uh, set of vectors through n points. And this relies on the fact that if you fix the degree data, which essentially corresponds to fixing the unbounded edges of a tropical curve, you can see there is a finite number of combinatorial types of tropical curves, by which I mean the data of the direction vectors of all edges in correspondence with some uh, vertices of the secondary polytope. And you can see for each combinatorial type, uh, if you impose the condition you're, you're, or for your, or your tropical curves to pass through and generic points, you either have a tropical curve of the given combinatorial type passing those points or you don't. So the count is one or zero. And if you sum all these up, you obtain a finite number of tropical curves. So for instance, I rewrote this dimension a little bit. If you look at genus zero curves, this cardinality will be 3D where D is the degree of the complex curve we were looking, we would look uh, then genus zero curves through 3D minus one points would be finite in P2. Um, 
Okay, and once we have this final set of tropical curves, we uh, Mikakin associates a number uh, using tropical multiplicities uh, of these curves. So we sum up of all this final set of tropical curves, their multiplicities, where the multiplicity of, the, of a tropical curve is defined in terms of multiplicities of the vertices. So this is a local definition. I call it local vertex multiplicities where the multiplicity at a vertex locally is defined by if you have a vertex V, um, you say U1, U2 is here. Apologies, there happened to problem with my figure. And uh, at V, you can take the multiplicity determinant U1, U2, for instance. And um, at V prime, you can take the determinant of these two things. So here I'm drawing the image of a tropical curve which is just a balanced graph. And by the balancing condition, it doesn't matter if you take this or this edge or this or this edge. This is a well-defined notion. And for every trivalent vertex, if you take the product of these vertex multiplicities, you obtain the multiplicity of your tropical curve. And to sum of all finite tropical curves to obtain at the end of the day, the Mikakin's tropical count. And the correspondence theorem of Mikakin says that the number of complex curves in a toric variety, once you fix delta and n, delta first defines the toric variety, touching the boundary with prescribed contact orders determined again by delta and matching n points in general position in x sigma. So we take n points in the general torus orbit in the toric variety. Uh, you can also take them in the boundary. Uh, and um, this number equals this, to this tropical count determined by Mikakin in dimension two. Just a question. Is this the Sorry. same thing as the log room of Witten invariant in this case? Yes, this is exactly, this is a log room of Witten invariant in this case. Yes, in dimension two, I will in a minute describe how Nishino Zibat's count is defined. And it is known that the count of Nishino Zibat is a log room of Witten invariant. And in dimension two, it is shown that the Nishino Zibat count agrees with Mikakin count. So it is a log room of Witten invariant. Yes. And in higher dimensions, the data we fix is, again, a genus, a degree data, again, the same data given by a collection of factors adding up to zero. In higher dimensions, we don't only fix points, but we fix upon linear subspaces with appropriate co-dimensions to ensure um, uh, we end up with a nice moduli problem. And we fix a triple of points in the big torus orbit of the toric variety X sigma. And then um, the state of this triple of points together with this um, FN linear subspaces, uh, using the state of these two things, um, we can define incidences, which are denoted by ZAP following Nishinozi, but notation uh, and we can actually define a family of incidences and it will become clear so the definition will make more sense once i tell you in a minute about the construction of this family the idea is to consider the linear spaces associated to these affine spaces and then consider you uh Take the, take the product with P and take the torus orbit. So um, you take the torus, so each linear space associated to these constraints to find some torus orbits. And you're taking those torus orbits um, containing P in some way. So this data of A and P determines some incidences in your toric variety, but not only in your toric variety, they determine a family of incidences. You can build a family of incidences. Um, and I will tell you this family in a minute. And the theorem then states that if you look at the number of tropical curves in Rn of degree D genus, sorry, degree delta, apologies, uh, genus G matching A, and uh, if you also consider on the other side the complex number 
number of complex algebra curves in the toric variety of degree D genus G and matching these constraints determined by A and P, then this complex number of complex algebra curves is equal to a multiplicity, um, e equal to some of multiplicities of these curves defined by Nishino Siebert. And this definition of multiplicities is different than what we had just shown here, which, in which was defined by Mikakin in terms of local vertex multiplicities. So this is a globally defined multiplicity. And I will tell what this multiplicity is. So there will be a combinatorial formula defining this multiplicity globally. And the idea is- um, Let me interrupt. Uh, sure. Wasn't at least the original paper by Nishino Siebert for genus zero curves? Uh, yes, um, that's true. They're elaborating that the problem is in the log deformation theory arguments, it's not immediate in some cases um, to generalize to higher genus, but they elaborate, they make a remark saying that everything should generalize um, analogously to a higher genus. And then uh, the details were worked out by Nishino and some non superabundant higher genus cases. That's true. Uh, yes, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, we do, in, in our paper, when we do the real analog of Nishino Z, but we um, do higher genus superabundant also. It's not very difficult to check the details where they remark that everything should analogously work for higher dimensions. It's not very hard to um, check that it works, the deformation theory arguments works for higher genus as well, but you're right. Okay, so the idea is uh, when you um, look, when you want to count such complex algebraic curves, um, the idea is to first count complex algebraic curves in some degenerate limits of your toric variety. So we will build a degeneration and count complex algebraic curves in the degenerate limit and then use some deformation theory to obtain curves in the general fiber. So the main motivation to do that is the observation that every curve in the toric variety, which will appear as the general fiber for degeneration, can be actually obtained as a deformation of, a, uh, of special types of curves which are called maximally degenerate log curves in the central fiber photoric degeneration. And this is one of the main um, lemmas in Nishino Z, but which is non-trivial, uh, but uh, after appropriate modifications, you can ensure that you can obtain every curve as a, a deformation of a nice maximally degenerate log curve. Um, which I will define in a second. And um, they, these curves live in the central fiber of a toric degeneration. And this is a degeneration uh, where you degenerate your general fiber into a union of toric varieties glued along toric strata. So we do determine this degeneration from the data of the uh, two things to fix the degree and A, delta and A. And the way we determine this degeneration is as follows. So once we have this data we fixed to set up our tropical problem, we have seen that um, you have, if you uh, fix uh, appropriate generic constraints, you end up with finitely many tropical curves of the given degree and matching these constraints. And then uh, to build up your degeneration, you consider all this finite set of tropical curves matching the given degree and constraints. And the support of all these finite, the many tropical curves determines if you put, uh, determines the polyhedral decomposition. So if you um, consider the images of all these finite, many tropical curves, you obtain a polyhedral decomposition of Rn. And then um, you 
embed it at height one and take the cone over this polyhedral decomposition, which builds, uh, uh, if your tropical curves live in R2, for instance, this cone will live in R3. So you get one more dimension, and this builds the toric band of the total space of your degeneration. So from the data of degree and constraints, you build a toric degeneration whose central fiber is um, determined by um, looking at the vertices of your tropical curves. Every vertex corresponds to a toric component. It looks at by balancing around every vertex, you locally have a toric fan. So you have many irreducible toric components of the central fiber. And the general fiber is determined by looking at the height zero piece of this big toric fan, which is given by taking the closure by taking the asymptotic fan, namely by just considering the unbounded edges. So if you have, for instance, a three constraints in R2 and you look at tropical curves of the degree given by these four vectors, then you have, by choosing a general, general configuration, you have either this tropical curve or there is one more option where the bounded edge could look like this one, uh, the other way. And this determines the toric degeneration of P1 cross P1, where the unbounded edges determine the toric variety P1. And the central fiber is a union of two copies of P2. And once we have this toric degeneration, we are going to look at, we are going to define our maximally degenerate curves that we mentioned in the central fiber of such toric degenerations. By definition, these are stable maps which satisfy a torically transversality condition. So it means that the image is disjoint from toric strata strata of codimension greater than one. This means that if you depict, for instance, the central fiber in this case, which was union of two toric varieties given by projective two uh, P2s, if you, if you draw the momentum point of in images, so, and you draw the dual graphs of your curves, the tropical analogs, they will just uh, not so the edges will not go through a uh, higher co dimension strata, they will really be due in the sense that the unbounded edges will uh, cross one dimensional strata and so on. So there is some transversality condition. This transversality condition we impose, and then the other condition we want maximum degenerate curves to satisfy is that at the nodal point of the domain. C0, uh, we want that uh, two sides of the two irreducible components um, should have the same intersection index uh, with this device that they cross. So if you have some components mapping to this component, some here, you want the same intersection index here. This is a usual condition that appears as known as kissing condition in Ramawitan theory. And for every vertex, we want uh, every component of the domain curve mapping into an irreducible component to be a line. By a line, we mean you only want um, one intersection point. So every um, with each boundary component. So every component of your maximal adherence curve mapping into a component of the central fiber is a line. OK, so these are very specific types of curves. And it is shown that any curve you're interested in counting in the degeneration and the deformation of um, the central fiber is obtained for, can be obtained from such maximal adherence curves. And these maximum degenerate curves are easy and nice to count tropically. And the whole idea, why to do toric degenerations? Why not? I mean, you have a toric variety, so we are always counting curves in toric varieties and nishnozi, but in higher dimensional toric varieties. Why don't we directly count here, but we degenerate into many toric varieties? The idea is that if you consider the dual graphs of maximum degenerate curves, which are tropicalizations of such curves. If you just consider your torque variety like P1 cross P1, the dual graph is this, and it is four valent. 
but we don't know well how to define tropical multiplicities if you have higher valence vertices. So we always determine things as maximum as possible and end up everything trivalent in each nice component. So we better uh, can understand how to define a tropical count after degenerating. This, in particular, such degenerations uh, have the effects that the dual graphs and the original toric variety decompose into trivalent graphs. So, uh, Timon in the paper of National Zimbabwe is stating that if you look at the number of maximal degenerate stable maps into the central fiber of the toric degeneration determined by delta and A's, then this number is given by some lattice index T. And this lattice index is defined by looking at a map of lattices where the domain is given by for every vertex of the domain of your tropical curve, you put a copy of your lattice. So if you have like two vertices, if your tropical curve is M is Z2, you would put here the direct sum of Z2 and Z2. And the image is defined slightly more complicated. So you take the quotient of the direction lattice M by the uh, direction vector of the bounded edges and of the unbounded edges and but for the unbounded edges you need that something um, reading the constraints. So what this whole thing is saying is the site um, you define a map of lattices ensuring that um, when you have a bunch of vertices of your tropical curve mapping into the components of the central fiber um, if um, you look at the kernel, so um, when, when you have a map of lattices, you can look at associated real vector spaces, transfer everything with C, for instance, uh, or in the real case with R. If you look at the kernel of such map, the, those will exactly consist of things which glue together. So this first factor, the definition of this map, ensures that if you have different components mapping of the curve mapping into different fibers, you want this to be zero to ensure that these uh, legs glue together here. And the second factor ensures that if you're given a bunch of constraints, you end up matching those constraints. So there is a combinatorial way uh, given by the status index, globally defined lattice index, to count maximal degenerate stable maps to the central fiber of a toric degeneration. And what we will be willing to count is not only maximal degenerate maps, but log maps, which carry some additional structure, which is essential to uh, enable us to do the deformation theory we will need to do some log logarithmic deformation theory to relate maximal degenerate curves to the curves in the general fiber. So um, to each maximal degenerate curve, we are going to put a structure, a log structure, which will tell us how to do the deformation theory. And we will, as a final step, count the possible ways of imposing a log structure to maximal degenerate curves. So, and the final um, Nishino Zibot count, this count will be given by this lattice index times the number of ways we can impose the log structure. And I will tell you briefly what this log structure is and uh, what we do with them. So, by definition, a uh, log structure is given by a sheaf of monads. If you have a scheme or a complex analytic space uh, in general, you can consider a sheaf of monads on it together with a homomorphism to the structure sheaf, which is an isomorphism once restricted to the invertible elements of your structure sheaf. This definition looks very ad hoc, but if you look at the case, so this is a structure uh, of pairs. So um, log geometry is generally an extension of algebraic geometry when you want to study pairs and do some deformation theory. So we want to study generally pairs, especially while looking at 
block chromobitin invariants where you impose some contact orders with a given device uh, in your uh, scheme. So we fix the device when you fix the device and um, denote the inclusion of the complement by J, you can naturally define a log structure which is defined by taking the regular functions on your scheme, but you only consider those ones which are invertible away from D. So the sheaf of regular functions, which have zeros only in D, defines a natural log structure. And um, this is called the divisorial log structure, which we will be considering um, on the toric varieties, uh, on the targets. So when we have uh, the total space of the toric degeneration, we will be considering the divisorial log structure, where in the total space we consider the central fiber as a device. And for instance, the, there are many log structures you can impose on a scheme, and uh, on a point, the standard one is defined by if you take this point spec C, uh, then you can take your sheaf of mono C star plus N and define uh, your map alpha by mapping it by mapping a triple x comma and to either x or zero. And this is a um, natural way to define a log structure on a point if your point is a point obtained from uh, a, so if you have uh, the fi line A1, and if you look at the divisorial log structure on A1 with the was given by the zero point, and if you pull back the divisorial log structure on this point, this is the log structure you're going to obtain. So there's a natural way to pull back log structures. So uh, the definition of log maps is as follows. So we endow all our spaces with log structures with sheaves. So the total space of the toric degeneration we endow with, with the divisorial log structure where we take x0 as the divisor. And uh, once you pull back this uh, log structure on the total space, we obtain a log structure on the central fiber. And we have this log structure on the standard log point. And we are looking at log maps where we also send out the domain curve with the sheaf of monoids. And the sheaf of monoids on the domain curve is determined by imposing this, imposing that we, requiring that we have a map to the standard log point, which is log smooth, which means that um, it locally looks uh, is given in terms of monoidal equations. And if you want this, if you impose this condition on this map, it determines an essential part of the log structure. And then we um, look at log maps, which are maps. Uh, satisfying some compatibility conditions and which make this diagram commute. And uh, so the log structures on the domain curve, this classification was done by Kate Kato by imposing this map to be log smooth over the standard log point. This whole, this whole condition and why we take this is a, a way to ensure that you will be able to do the formation theory and if you take a deformation over A1, your domain curve is going to smooth over A1. If you work in more complicated situations, sometimes you need to change this and take other log points or monoids if your curve needs can be deformed, uh, not over A1, but other things. But this is a definition ensuring us that we look at um, log curves in the central fiber including enough information about the degeneration. That's why we don't consider on the central fiber only the divisorial log structures given by the toric boundary devices, but we consider the total space and then the pullback of the log structure from the total space because we want enough information, the degeneration parameters in this log structure. Okay, and then it is shown by Nishino and Seabat that if you have um, maximal degenerate curve. And if you want to put log structures on such maximal degenerate curves, so the number of log maps with underlying maximal degenerate curve with uh, associated with a fixed tropicalization is given by the 
product of the weights on um, bounded edges times the product of weights on the unbounded edges, which are marked and which are asked to satisfy the given set of constraints. So the idea goes through, so um, the fact that when we talk about tropicalizations of these curves, you can imagine them as uh, dual, um, dual um inter dual graphs like every um irreducible component you is or is traded by a vertex of the graph every node is traded by an edge and every marked point is traded by an unbounded edge and the main idea to prove such a theorem is to observe that the nodal points of c uh, essentially determine all the contributions to um, to the uh, essentially determine uh, if um, so if you have a nodal point uh, locally of the form x y equal t to e then e determines the weight on that bounded edge and um, tropically um, when you fix your tropical curve you determine some discrete some essential ingredient of your log structure but there could be differences by um, some non discrete parts which differ only by this E many ways, so this weight many ways. And um, so the tropical multiplicity at the end of the day is given by counting all such possible structures and the times the number of uh, maximal adherence curves, which is given by the status index. So you have these two products. And um, this tropical multiplicity of Nishino Z bet is the number of complex curves in um, toric varieties. Um, so this was done in the complex geometric setup. And what we do is in our paper with Buso, we generalize everything that I told uh, by considering everything endowed with additional real structures. So by definition, a real structure on a scheme is an anti-holomorphic involution on the set of complex points of the scheme. And the real morphism between complex algebraic varieties with real structures is a morphism satisfying this compatibility condition. Then the main theorem we prove is that the number of real maximal degenerate stable maps with associated tropical curve equals the twisted real lattice index of this map of lattices, the same map of lattices, uh, where I will tell you what twisted real lattice index is. So if you have a map of lattices, uh, of finite index, then you can look at the co kernel. So, this is going to be a free abelian group. You can decompose it. So, if you consider the primary decomposition of the co kernel, then we define the real, real index of such a map of lattices by two to the number of PIs that appear in the primary decomposition, which are two. And then you can, if you transfer everything with R in this map of lattices, then and look at the number of elements in the kernel, this is by definition is the real lattice index. So in the real case, there is some technicality which I will not elaborate much about, but um, in the complex case, this map is always going to be surjective. In the real case, this is not always true, so we need to, to introduce some additional notion of twisting to that will take care of that issue. But in assuming this map is always surjective, so you just define the real lattice index like this. And then the next the next factor to define the tropical count was the number of log structures. So we are not looking at only log structures, but we introduced the notion of real log structures and um, allowing us to count real log curves. So by definition, um, real, a real log structure is given by a real structure on the scheme X and a real in, in an involution on this um, 
chief of monads on X, satisfying some obvious compatibility conditions. And we... Um, so if you are looking at a toric variety uh, and looked at the toric log structure, uh, how would you put a real log structure on that? Uh, on 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 a toric variety on the yeah. toric log structure, yes. So um, I had shown uh, lemma in um, one of my um, papers called "Real Kotonakawa Spaces." There's a canonical way to lift uh, real involution of on um, on. There's a canonical way to lift an involution uh, on a variety where you consider the divisorial log structure if this involution satisfies a condition, uh, namely it needs to leave the divisor invariant, then you can canonically define uh, uh, an involution on this uh, it, it lifts to an involution as a log map. So there is some condition you need to require to be able to define a real structure on. I guess the um, question really yeah. is what happens to the characteristic monoid under this Exactly. Like, could you be really concrete about A2, say? <laughs> yeah. Apologies. Sorry. Could you be really concrete? Like, what happens to A2 with the, with the, the toric log structure? And what, happen, what happens to the N2? Uh, like if you consider the A2, the FI2 plane, and consider the toric log structure given by x equals zero and y equals zero, mm -hmm. then um, so you're looking at the characteristic monads around the origin. It will be generated by two things, say. Uh, x, x and y, m bar will be isomorphic to um, uh, like natural numbers and two, because if you put the toric log structure, so you're looking at just regular functions which are invertible away from d, so, so they're of the form some invertible function times x to a and y to b. So if you forget the invertible function, if you just look at the characteristic monad or basic monad of the log structure, you have x to a by to b, you have a b. So your involution is induced by, in this case, you can define an involution uh, by mapping a b to um, b a or so you can, there are several ways of defining an involution which would lift to a log structure or minus a minus p is another option. And um, I think this is nice, this is not nice in my paper at some point, but I, mean, I think we are considering the involution that does not exchange the two boundary components. No, I mean, I mean, no, so I'm mean, sorry, I, should, I wasn't quite explicit enough. I, I was thinking A2 with the real structure coming from complex conjugation. So, right. So is the evolution with the with the evolution of monoids just be the, the identity in, at this point? Would it not be would it would it not be an evolution? Right. So you can consider the identity, but you can also consider the non-trivial involution. Um, oh, but, but but okay, but, but but complex conjugation would be the by identity. complex conjugation, yes. And um in our paper with Pyrrhic, we are considering the involution which is just induced by the complex conjugation. Right. And, and so what is the map? What is I tilde X then? What is uh, what? Sorry. 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 What, what, is, what is the map of what is the induced map on characteristic monoids? Uh, if you consider the complex conjugation involution, um, I think it is a b maps to a minus b. I need to double check apologies. Or minus a minus b, sorry. Um, I'm pretty sure I made a remark about this because I, 
I'm confused if it is BA or minus A minus because I studied all possible in a former work. I studied all possible real involutions where you can define different real involutions to try to understand different real structures. So that was the aim of my previous paper. So I think the involution by complex conjugation, the map on the Gauss sheet level should be uh, A, B maps to minus A minus B. Sorry, do you but remind me again what your notation was? So that A and B weren't the generators for N2, though. So um, your characteristic monoid is um, the, you look at, uh, so on your A2 with the Zori log structure given by X times Y, X equals zero union Y equals zero, you look at the sheaf of regular functions with zeros only and zero. So your characteristic monoids will uh, be of rank two because you look at regular functions, which are some invertible, so, so which are of the form x to a, y to b. So if x, y are your coordinates. By definition, your log structures, the sheaf of functions, which are zero, um, which are invertible away from D. So if X is zero is this, Y is e equals zero is this. So you're looking at functions, some invertible function times X to power A, Y to power B. So your characteristic monad, to define your characteristic monad, you forget the invertible part. So you identify by taking the log, a map similar to the log map, by identifying X to A, Y to B with the tuple A, B, just by considering the powers. So the stock of your characteristic monoids um, at the origin will be of the form AB and away from the origin A0, B0, and so on. And um, I think, it, so we are considering the complex, the involutions which are induced by complex conjugations. Apologies, uh, these involutions on the characteristic monoids are just given by identity. Okay, good. Uh, that, was, that was my guess. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. Uh, because the complex conjugation affects only the um, only the non-discrete part on the characteristic monoid, it does not affect anything. Apologies, you're absolutely right. On the characteristic monoid part, these involutions are identity. Uh, so we look at involutions which on the tropical parts on the Basic monads are identity, yes. That was a very good question. Apologies for my confusion. So the confusion <laughs> arose because I studied a moduli space of all possible involutions in my real Katonakayama paper where I looked at other involutions which were not identity on characteristic monad because on that on, on a previous work, my aim was to classify all real structures, but sorry. In, in this case, they're all identity. Thank you for the question. Okay, so um, then our theorem is saying that the number of real maps of a maximal adjacent curve in X0 with uh, associated tropical curve equals this product of um, real uh, weights, which are the real weight is two if the weight is even and one if the weight is odd. And as a result, we obtained a straightforward generalization of Nishino's but where to the setup where we look at real curves. So the number of real curves in the general fiber of the toric degeneration is given by this real lattice index we defined times real weights. So these real weights are just two. Um, there is also a real here. Two if your weight is even and one if your weight is odd because there are two possible log structures you, you can impose if your weight is even, ensuring that you live to a real curve um, and one if it is odd. And um, the problem is that we obtain a count of real curves in any dimension. But the problem is that this count is not invariant. So we need to introduce signs and count everything with signs. And um, so we introduce in the setup uh, analogs of Bell-Schenger signs, 
So in the two-dimensional case, where the real counts were counted together with signs and um, to obtain invariance, so in previous work of Mikakin, Itamar Carla Malchusten, they used Spanchenger signs and their tropical analogs to address this real enumerative problem in P2, first by Mikakin in P2. So if you fix your degree generic set of points, and if you look at real rational curves of degree D matching a generic set of points in RP2, then the Valshenger sign is minus one to the S, where S is the number of elliptic nodes. And if you uh, look at NDR plus, uh, which denotes the number of real rational curves with even number of elliptic nodes, and if NDR minus denotes the odd number, the ones with odd number of solitary nodes, then it was observed by Valshenger that the difference does not depend on the choice of point configuration, and this is a version of invariant. And Mikakin gave a combinatorial way, a tropical way to compute tropical version of invariants for P2, and showed the correspondence between version of invariants defined by version And this was generalized from P2 to toric pixel surfaces by um, Itamar, Carlo Mau, Schusten, uh, where they consider only real configuration of points, and then by Schusten, where he also considers not only real, but complex pairs, conjugate pairs of points. What we do is we use the slope geometric setup in the language of the generation to define these version just signs. So what we do is to analyze Oculus equations essentially. So we're interested in understanding real curves in the general fungal photoric degeneration. So uh, the, we need to understand the nodes. There can be have there can occur two types of nodes. And um, uh, first, in, there can you can have nodes which already exist and which are preserved in the degeneration. And second, if you count curves in the central fiber while smoothing it, in the smoothing, you can obtain new nodes coming from the double smoothing of the double locus. So if you have some curve mapping to some central fiber like this, you might already have a given set of nodes. But while smoothing from this intersection, you can obtain a new set of nodes. So we need to analyze all these nodes uh, to determine if they're elliptic or not. And um, we, so it's as, as a fact of matter, these nodes, which are already existing, that map in the interior of some toric component of the central fiber, you can count them by counting the integral points and in the polytope associated to this um, component of the central fiber. And so we, what we needed to do is to do a little bit more work to analyze the nodes that are produced in the degeneration. So if you do the smoothing, um, we analyze what's happening to do that. So we do some base change to be able to write the local equation and the total space around these points in a nice way. And then we analyze the morphisms between the log structures, uh, which by definition of a log structure determine. So the log morphism between the log structures on the central fiber, essentially by definition of log structures determine the local equation and the smoothing. So we analyzed those equations and we obtained this theorem saying that if you have a maximal degenerate log curve mapping to the central fiber, then um, if you look at the smoothing, um, there can, and if you try analyze the nodes that can be generated uh, by smoothing the double locus, so remember that so tropically, these correspond to, so you have, uh, a, so you look at transfer, historically transverse curves. So you have edges of your tropical corresponding tropical curve, which are transverse to the double locus. And it depends on if this weight is even or odd on that edge. Uh, so the weight is, uh, if the weight is odd, then, um, 
the weight on that edge equals to the number of integral points on the um, polyto picture of your associated to the central fiber. If this is all done, we deduce that we obtain m minus one nodes, which are elliptic by analyzing the equations. And if it is even, we deduce there can be two possible ways of smoothing. In one, we obtain m minus one nodes, which are elliptic. In the other, we obtain m minus two, uh, which we obtain um, hyperbolic nodes and pairs of complex conjugated nodes. So if you do this analysis, you see that of these generated nodes, there is nothing that affects the version design because if M is odd, you look at minus one to the number of elliptic nodes, minus one to M minus one, M minus one is even, you get one. So nothing changes here. If M is even, these two things cancel each other. So again, nothing changes. So we arrive at the conclusion that the nodes generated in this meeting never affect the version design. So we use just a tropical formulation to count the nodes uh, that already existed in the interiors of toric components, which were given by minus one to the number of lattice points and the polytopes due to vertices of the tropical curve. And um, we define analogously as Itenberg, Carlo Mauschistan, and Mikakin, the tropical multiplicity of a tropical curve as the product of these minus one to the number of integral points in the interior. And we define a tropical count by summing over all these real tropical multiplicities. And finally, um, we define also the log analog of the version just signs as the number of uh, minus one to the number of elliptic nodes obtained in the smoothing in the general fiber. And then we obtain this invariance result, namely if you count uh, your real log curves together with the elliptic nodes, then this number is invariant and equals to, to a tropical number given by counting integral points uh, in the polytopes uh, due to the tropical curves. And we obtain this result uh, for toric pixel surfaces where we had imposed all of our conditions to be real. Our hope was to, because we also had to find real counts in any dimension, our hope was to find a way to obtain a way to Tropically, at least we were close to understanding signs in higher dimensions and to obtain invariance in some cases, like in cluster cases, but um, we haven't achieved that yet. It turned to be a more difficult problem to analyze the signs than we were hoping. And um, there is some on ongoing work. Uh, we have been discussing this with a former student of um Itamark called Toma Bluma, uh, who has some good ideas about this, I should say. Okay, maybe I think this is a good point to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.